welcome Van and Hannah. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I just want to, uh, from the outset, I want to make the most important acknowledgement of all. I'm aware of the fact that I'm on unceded land tonight. I always like to acknowledge that I personally live on the land of the Wathorong people of the Kulin Nation. And I make that acknowledgement when I travel because Australia, a continent, is a place of many nations. And recognising that diversity, recognising that the land that we share is a legacy of the most extraordinary custodianship that every single person who inhabits this continent benefits from. And I make my personal acknowledgement to Elders past, present and emerging for the enormous, humbling privilege of being on your land tonight. Um, now, for the rest of you, I'd just like to say this is my chat with my friend who's amazing <laughs> and it's awesome that you're here, but I'm just going to chat to her <laughs> because Hannah Kent's amazing. Uh, uh, presumably you are here because you have had the delectable experience of consuming a Hannah Kent novel. There's 2013's Burial Rites, which is set in the wilds of agricultural Iceland. You know, mysterious, romantic, alienating, terrifying, incredible, moving, humane and powerful. There's 2016, 2016's The Good People, which goes back to my ancestral country in the west coast of Ireland, um, looking at the intersection of, of secret communities, mysticism, pervasive folk belief. Of course, we're here tonight to talk about, you know, Hannah's career, but also 2021's Devotion, which is just an absolutely staggering love story taking place in Germany in the midst of religious and political upheaval and making the extraordinary journey across continents to Australia. Hannah inhabits the most beautiful worlds. They're places of... of, of a historical tangibility that also exists in this sort of dark fairy tale universe where these ordinary people's lives are elevated to the stuff of, of great heroism and bravery, trapped in situations that they always find the imaginative courage to find their way out of, even if tragedy results. They're incredibly lush novels. Hannah's grip on, on language, her extraordinary vocabulary has been noted by critics all over the world. Her ability to, to denote these incredible sensuous experiences, the, the tactility of expression that she brings to her writing. We are in the presence of a truly great Australian novelist. Oh man, what an introduction. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Um, Van, thank you. Um, I feel a little bit sweaty and blushy after hearing that amazing introduction. Thank you so much. That's very generous. Thank you all so much for having me here tonight. It's a real privilege. And let me also add that um, I have done so much of my writing on the on the country of the Paramount people, uh, also known as the Adelaide Hills. And you're right, it is absolutely right that we should acknowledge the country that we live and work and where we do our storytelling. Um, but thank you very much for welcoming me here tonight. It's a real, real privilege to be here. It's great. Like, I'm so excited because I've been in love with Hannah for years. <laughs> and the reason why I love your work so much is the incredible empathy that you bring to these stories of, of of women characters who otherwise have been written out of the historical record. Your three novels are set in the past. Mm. Um, they're set in a 19th century in different European contexts, but with similarities and with differences. But they speak to this sort of quiet desperation of the, the female characters who were written out of the literature of their own time mm. and telling these buried stories. How did you end up on a, a journey of of examining the past in that way? I think I fell into it, to be honest. I mean, I, I actually never set out to be, even be a novelist. My interest, I studied creative writing at university, and I mean, writing is always something that I wanted to do. When I was much younger, I wanted to be a poet, and then by the time I was studying writing at university, I wanted to be a playwright. Um, so I did a lot of drama. It wasn't necessarily like, I'm gonna set out and write books about women who have been misrepresented in history. What happened, I think, is what happens to many writers is that 
you find yourself obsessed by a story or perhaps more to the point, the absence of a story, you know, the absence of complexity, the absence of, uh, you know, humanity. Some, you know, you come across something and it seems completely riddled with holes and you want to know why that's the case and what the story might well have been when you sense that it has been mis misrepresented. And this is what happened in the case of burial rights. I, um, I didn't actually, I'd, I was a bit nervous about going and studying writing at university. I had been told, I don't know, by society that it wasn't something that was worth doing. And I kind of bought myself a year after high school by going on exchange to Iceland. And it was there that I, you know, I lived very close to to a site which is actually, a, you know, still has incredible contemporary importance for Iceland to this day, which is the last execution in that country. And I remember I was driving through this beautiful valley with my host family at the time. And um, I mean, the valley was extraordinary, but it was kind of pocketed by these little mounds everywhere. And I remember asking about them and, I, you know, I didn't know anything about Iceland at that stage. And I was sort of, you know, are these Viking burial mounds or whatever? And they said, no, that's not the case. They were caused by an avalanche, but this is an important site. Nonetheless, it was the site of a beheading in 1830. In fact, two people were beheaded, and the, the last one, a woman called Agnes Magnus Dotter, ended up being the last person executed in that country for a crime of double murder. And I mean, I was immediately fascinated, as I think anyone would be, you know. Um, and I started asking more questions, you know, what, why did she do it? And the answers that I got were hugely dissatisfying. I, uh, I ended up asking a lot of people in the area where I was living, you know, what happened to Agnes? Why did she end up being accused of stabbing two men to death, essentially, and then setting fire to a farm? And the answer I got was always one of, oh, she was just sort of, she was, you know, she was bad. She was evil. She was a woman scorned. I was always sort of hearing about her in terms of stereotype. It was always unequivocal. There was no mention of her life or the circumstances that had led her to what was clearly a, a, you know, a, a terrible situation. And that, she stayed with me, I think, because I just couldn't, I didn't get a sense of her. I had a sense of her death, but I didn't have a sense of who she was. And that then led me to um, start researching and, and her life to try and find out you know, who, who she was. I found out that she was a, a pauper. She'd been abandoned by her mother at six years old. I ended up doing all this research into Iceland of the time, the fact that there were no institutions that were there to provide for, you know, children who, who had these kinds of circumstances. The only institution that really existed was the church. And, you know, children in her circumstances which basically just kind of billeted out to farms, made to work from a very early age. And so I sort of tumbled headfirst into, into this world of research, historical research, and it became hugely addictive and hugely satisfying because what emerged was this very complex portrait of a woman who in many ways was fated by the circumstances into which she was born. And I think that process of kind of falling in love with research and realising that so many received narratives that we, we get from historical records or just from popular sort of social narrative do you know are missing so much particularly in the lives of women but more specifically the lives of women who are also of what are often deemed as a peasant class of the you know there's a social there's a class element in there as well and i just i just became so fascinated then with the ways in which the histories i have received growing up are missing so many of these stories of the lives of of women and because they were never also allowed to tell them themselves or they didn't have the means or they were actively silent, silenced. So this was sort of the, it was really, it all started with Agnes Magnus Dottir. And from that point on, I just, yeah, became completely, yeah, obsessed is the word my mother uses, but just intensely curious about the ways in which we <laughs> portray women, uh, or in which women in the past have been portrayed, particularly women who are involved in crime. And perhaps what, you know, it's, it's always still, I think, the absence and the silence which draws me back into asking those kinds of questions. Because one of the, I mean, they are stridently feminist novels mm. and connect with this sense of the prisons that are made, that society has made for women, the patriarchal structures have made for women, whether it's the church or tradition or national identity, but particularly religion and social custom. Mm. One of the things that's really uh, captivating about the, the story of Agnes in burial rights 
is that she's imprisoned in a country that has no prisons. Mm. And the metaphor of the trapped woman, like the idea that she's condemned, she has no freedom, and she, it, it, again and again she's deprived of choices in her own life by the geography, becomes a metaphor for the female character in literature. Mm, yeah. And is, I mean, when it comes to devotion as well, you have these characters who are um, from this community who make the most inconceivable journey. Like, they traverse continents. They see, like, an expanse of the planet that very few people do, and yet themselves are completely trapped mm. in structures that they have no control over. You know, is that it, it, looking at that sort of that metaphor of the trapped? Is that something that you're deliberately doing in terms of trying to liberate women, mm. or is that just coming from the organic place? I think it's you know it's such a good question. I think it's these are the things that become interest you know interesting to me, and I think are, are the things I want to discuss. But once the book is written, I think a lot of this stuff emerges organically, and I also think that with with my books. Um, the, the next book, you know, the seeds of it are always from the one that precedes it. I mean, I've only written three. I mean, pff, here I am talking like I've got a long list. But I, I mean, mean, to be fair, that's more than most people. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I've I mean, only <laughs> written three books and Hollywood has bought at least two. <laughs> <laughs> Chronic <laughs> underperformer Hannikin <laughs> speaks. I think... Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks for putting me in my place, Pam. Um, but, I mean, you know, I think all of this stuff becomes apparent to me. I mean, I'm, I'm never sitting there at the desk tapping away and saying, you know, which socio-political theme am I going to explore today? I mean, it's always a fascination with character for me, as I think it is for a lot of novelists. And so the books always start from that place. You know, it was that interest in Agnes. It was a question mark over who she really was. And then the process of research, I mean, that book required so much translation. And my, you know, my Icelandic was pretty rusty at that stage and it was taking a long time. And so, because I'm a massive nerd, one day I thought I'd give myself a break and, you know, read old English sources because occasionally newspapers would mention, you know, executions committed in foreign countries. So I started reading old English newspapers, um, wondering if they would have mentioned Agnes Magnus Dottir. And they didn't, but it was in reading those newspapers and being in that time and kind of having this consideration of you know, historical crime and women involved in historical crime that I came across the story of Nance Roach, who then became one of the main characters of The Good People. Uh, you know, it wasn't, there was this tiny little article that I stumbled across. It was, she was described as an old woman at the Tralea Sizes, uh, who, you know, was described as superannuated and, you know, kind of, the, the journalist was describing her in all these sort of derogatory terms. And she was held, uh, under arrest for some very serious charges and, and was defending herself at the Assizes, calling herself a fairy doctress and saying that she couldn't be held accountable because all she was ever trying to do was banish a changeling. And I mean, I read this and it was the defence which just jumped out at me and I thought, okay, either she's sort of making this up or it's tongue in cheek as a sort of a bizarre way to get out from these charges or this is something that she genuinely believes. And if so, what is this woman's world like? You know, this what would it have been like to have those belief systems? Um, what, you know, how was her world so different from the world of the court? I mean, it was already clear in the way in which they were describing her. And that then led me into this sort of, you know, rabbit hole of, of inquisitiveness into folklore and folk beliefs and sympathetic magic and herbalism and the slow sort of separation of folklore from Catholicism, which occurred, you know, with the with the sort of the um, un the Act of Union and things like that in Ireland. So I just kind of, and then you know, I was so fascinated in those sort of, in those worlds, and in in, in again in, in being raised in this kind of in the old ways, as as this woman referred to them, and how that would have been clashing up against the new urban centres, this world of you know. Uh, where knowledge must, you know, knowledge comes from literacy, knowledge comes from books, medicine is on the up, you know, is, is rising up, so herbalism is falling away, and these old oral cultures essentially disintegrating under the rising authority of the church. So, I mean, you start to get an, a sense of the worlds in which these people lived and how so much of that, their actions, comes from external circumstances rather than internal. So it's not necessarily that anyone is good or bad, it's just that they're making the choices that they feel they have available to them. And then so much of the good people, 
that so much of devotion came came about as a way for, as a as sort of a reaction against those previous two novels. I wanted to step away from essentially researching women who committed terrible crimes. I was realizing if I kept doing that, I was kind of painting myself into a corner. You know, let's pick a you know executed woman and say she didn't Lizzie do it. Lizzie Borden is coming. Oh my gosh, Lizzie Borden's been done to death. Don't get me started on Lizzie Borden. I mean, great interpretations, but you know, I could see that as a as a possibility, and I thought, no, I need to. I need to move away from this darkness particularly. And it was, you know, in that sense then that devotion was born because devotion for me was so much more about, you know, reaching towards a place of, of, of joyousness. And I mean, those of you who might have read it <laughs> might disagree with that, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted to celebrate something, I guess. So it, it, that's what I mean. So, I mean, these are the kind of, I wish that I could sort of sit here and think, yes, I'm deeply invested in interrogating, you know, these feminist issues or these issues of representation. But so much of that stuff, I think, just comes out of my own interests as someone who exists in a contemporary world and who is troubled by the ways in which women have been oppressed in the past. But it's not necessarily like I'm articulating that to myself when I'm writing. I'm just interested in character. I just want to know who these people are and what their worlds look like. How did you get from the west coast of Ireland? Because just full acknowledgement, my family are actually from Tralee, which oh, is really? why, yeah. yeah. Right. And it, sort of reflecting on that, immigrant story, how did you get to Prussia from, mm. which is the um, the initial setting of devotion, from from Trelay, from Kerry? I think it wasn't actually moving from Kerry to, um, to Prussia, but it was from Kerry to Australia. Devotion, so much of devotion originated, I mean, after me going on about character, that wasn't necessarily the case for devotion. So my interest uh, and the origins of this book began in my love of Paramount country, the place where I grew up and where I live now. Um, I, I am so fortunate to live in truly what I think is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And I had returned back there after publishing The Good People, um, after living in Melbourne for some time. And I was so, my sense of wonder at the place, you know, at this beautiful place was just kind of just struck me when I moved back there. And I was living, you know, amongst the most gorgeous, landscape and I and I had always been asked particularly after the good people you know why don't you write about Australia um, people often made quite a, a point of the fact that I'd written about Iceland and Ireland and you know was I doing all the eyes first and then when would I get to Australia <laughs> and I am um, ah journalism <laughs> <laughs> and um, and that was really you know it was I loved writing about those landscapes Iceland Ireland because I felt I very much felt an outsider to them but I felt it made me regard them with fresh eyes and it made me ask questions that perhaps people familiar with those landscapes or familiar with those cultures might not necessarily ask. And then I, I started thinking, you know, here I am returning to a place that I know intimately and yet I have that same sense of wonder as an outsider and a renewed appreciation. And I thought, I wonder if I can do what I think is one of the most challenging things about writing which is to distill the beauty of a landscape, to distill the beauty of nature into prose, to try and capture some of that sort of ineffability. So my starting point with devotion was the Australian landscape. It was, it was a thing, okay, I've done other places now, can I write about my homeland? Can, can I write about it as someone who is deeply familiar with it? Um, and then I started to think, okay, is this something I wanna do? Is it gonna be a historical novel? Because immediately my thought is, I don't want to write a novel about colonisation. You know, I'm never going to write a novel from the perspective of an Indigenous or First Nations character. That's not my place to take up. That is not my voice or culture to appropriate. The alternative for me is then to write from the perspective of, you know, a white coloniser, uh, you know, speaking historically. And the problem with writing historical fiction and writing historical characters is that you always, to some degree, have to adopt the ideologies that would have been held at the time. You have to adopt the same worldview. And I didn't want to adopt the, the worldview of you know, a white coloniser around the settlement of, of South Australia as I was deciding at that time. So the next, but at the same time, I felt this deep compulsion to write about this landscape. I wanted to return sort of to what was familiar. And that then led me to consider, which is something which I'd always been kind of interested in, which was the emigration of Prussians to South Australia, the colony of South Australia, uh, and the settlement of these intensely religious villages uh, on unceded Paramount country. 
basically these, there were Prussians who in Prussia at the time were known as old Lutherans because they refused to accept the Union Church which had been instigated by King Frederick William III. Um, over time, the pressure to join his church had become greater and greater and still they refused and so they'd begun to, they'd been imprisoned and fined, pastors had gone, had fled or gone into hiding, you know, families were being thrust into poverty, uh, you know, as a result of their religious beliefs. And I was kind of struck by the irony and the hypocrisy of this persecuted people seeking sanctuary in, an, in a colony. Uh, and then kind of inflicting the same amount of persecution on, on the people whose land they were stealing in the name of finding religious freedom. And I thought, well, there's enough nuance and ambiguity there that I think perhaps I can explore it. And then the other issues in terms of adopting voice, adopting the historical voice of a coloniser became something which I think in many ways directed my creative approach in this book. Um, but that was kind of how it came about. It's just sort of a lot of me kicking back in my chair and just kind of musing on the things that I want to do and what might be difficult and then always choosing the most difficult version of that. Um, I'm not sure why. I think that's why I like writing. I think it's because I do find it really hard, but I like the challenge. Um, Devotion is an absolutely <coughs> devastating love story. And in other interviews that you've given, not that I'm jealous or envious that you spoke to other people about this book. <laughs> Sorry, Fan. Um, that you've spoken about how it was a love story that you desperately wanted to read when yeah. you were a young person. And there's a sense of just absolute joy, even when these characters are tortured by their love for one And it is really torturous. Like, these girls were burning up. Um, to be together, there is something so incredibly beautiful and and profound about it. Talk us through your process there and how you, mm. you wrote a love story for your teenage self. Yeah, I wasn't always going to. I, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I actually, when I was thinking, okay, I want to move away from, you know, you know, death by broad axe and towards something more joyous, I thought, what, what would I like to celebrate? And I was considering the women I guess inevitably seems to happen, um, who, who were part of these old Lutheran communities because, uh, because I live in places where, you know, many people, you know, their great-grandmothers still spoke German, etc. cetera. It's a, it's a very much part of sort of the local history and there's always sort of an outcry in the local papers whenever someone sticks up an old, another memorial to, you know, our pioneering ancestors. Um, you know, I say that with respect to those, to the people who are related to that, and I am related to them, but, you know, this idea of sort of these pious pioneers is kind of this hagiographic memorialisation that I think actually does no one any favours. Um, but there's always sort of an article in the paper because people are objecting to the women being left off the list of families who, for instance, um, started the village of Handorf in the Adelaide Hills um, on land that was known as Bakatilla. And I, um, and I started thinking about these women. Uh, I'm related to these communities through my grandmother, who was an incredible woman, and who I had been thinking about a lot. And, um, and I always was wondering about the, the value of friendship between these women, and perhaps the way, and then I was thinking again, you know, in my sort of disordered way of approaching a novel, of how friendship so often, you know, takes a lower rung on the hierarchy of meaningful relationships, you know, in terms of what society upholds to be most valuable. But sometimes, you know, a friendship can be the most meaningful relationship in your life, irrespective of whether or not you might have children or a partner and so on. So I started thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'm going to broach this subject by writing about the friendship these women could have potentially had with one another. And then it was 2017 and we had the plebiscite. And I mean, I was out to my family, I was with my now wife, I was pregnant with our first child, you know, belonging to communities, super secure in my queerness. Um, but I was, also, I was totally unprepared for how angry I would become and how sad I was going to become at the vitriol that arrived in our letterbox. And it actually kind of thrust me into this kind of anxiety over the value of what I contribute as a writer. I started thinking, you know, I'm not doing anything you know I just what is what is the value of putting words on a page I'm not I'm not helping anyone there's people who don't have that same kind of support that I do you know how and this is how I'm feeling how are they feeling and then I sort of had to give myself a bit of a slap around the face and think you know you believe in the power of storytelling this is something that is you know within your reach you believe in the power of representation and it then you know I realized that friendship wasn't going to cut it I needed to write 
the queerest love story I could, still keeping, you know, the setting of a very pious old Lutheran congregation immigrating. And I mean, it was just, you know, I realized that it would bring its challenges. But among, alongside that decision, as soon as I decided I was going to write a queer love story, the, the most significant decision I then made was that it wasn't going to be centered around shame. And I think, um, I think this came from having read many historical novels which feature queer characters. I mean, Sarah Waters, love her. But so many of those books, you know, people who are familiar with that work, there's so often this sense that for two people to be together, they must be ostracised. I mean, they're cast out from their communities or they have to live separately from their societies. Or there's, you know, punishment either inflicted upon them by others or by themselves. Or there's even sort of a lack of sort of clear-eyed awareness of the nature of their feelings so that, you know, everything's kind of clouded with ignorance or, or repression. And I just was kind of at this point when everyone's sort of voting on my right of whether or not I can marry my partner. I just thought, I oh, know, I just want this... I want to have two, these two characters that I'd been working on, I want them to fall in love and I want them to, if not immediately, certainly later, absolutely be aware of the fact that they're in love with one another. And I want to, if I can, avoid any kind of punishment for that. And that was the challenge I set myself and then the, you know, you know however many thousands of words later and lots of hand wringing, that's kind of, that's as devotion as what I came up with. There are some extraordinary scenes in it. Like one of there's a there's a beautiful scene in where you describe a, a forest that is a cathedral. That's this connection that the that the lovers have to the natural world that they live in. There's something incredibly pure about their love story, which mm. is it's alarming because it's striking mm. and it makes you realise how how much literature as a book nerd you consume and i will i will speak universally i am going to speak <laughs> universally everybody but just that you know the the limitations of gazes yeah. really restrict us imaginatively like for it to be striking that these just two girls are falling in love uh, you know representative of the natural order of the environment that they inhabit that in itself is a verdict on patriarchal lenses that we haven't shared and heteronormative lenses we haven't shared. I think, yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. And I mean, this is something that I didn't know whether or not I would be able to do because, you know, there's so much, you know, so much of the book, the, 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 the structure of the congregation or the community that they, belonged in, that they belong in, the religion, you know, the Lutheran church, all of these things is geared around a very sort of patriarchal system of authority and yet I think that's probably why I wanted to align these characters with the natural world and with a natural order and with a kind of beauty. I mean so much of, um, you know, you mentioned earlier how this is kind of a, a, an offering to my closeted self. You know, when I was, when before I was out I was reading, you know, as, as someone like me does, I turn to books to try and find myself there to make sense of the things that you're feeling and I mean the first LGBT QI plus book I read was The Well of Loneliness. And I mean, an amazing yeah, not e book. not exactly a happy time, you know, that book. It's just like, you know, crack out the Radliff call the hall for some laughs is not a thing anybody has ever just, said. Just for the jollies. Yeah. But um, I mean, but that's this the perfect, ends well. <laughs> yeah, no. the perfect example. I mean, what a title. And there you are, someone trying to, to, to basically find evidence or assurance or validation that you can fall in love and have a happy ending, you know, have a satisfying relationship. And I just kept on kind of coming across books like that, which very much distinctly said no. And so when it came to sort of writing this book, I wanted to kind of elevate this, this love story to, to the point where it is presented as something which is whole and divine and very much as belonging to, the, to, to things of beauty. Has it been banned in the United States yet? <laughs> Actually, let's, you know, I, I, I have great um, US publishers who published uh, Burial Rights and the Good People, but they elected not to publish Devotion, actually. So I don't have a US publisher for this book. No. Yeah, yeah. And look, I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's because of the subject matter, because, I mean, there's so many books which are extraordinary, which are published in the US, but, I mean, pff, make of it what you want, I don't know. Well, I mean, it is an interesting time. I mean, as as a, a literary culture, it is terrifying to yeah. look at the 
concerted attempts in the United States to ban Borgs mm. and to act like to pursue the banning of Borgs in a in you know a liberal democratic Western country where these things are supposed to be you know like a, a, a birthright of the democracy we live in is to access books that we yeah. want to read and write whatever we like how does that register with you as an author like to watch I mean especially in the wake of really important civil rights and social justice struggles like the marriage equality referendum mm. and I'd just like to apologize on behalf of the people who <laughs> never will that was an outrageous thing to yeah, do to individuals families communities and to this country like mm. and prevailing was ecstatic but I would rather not have the war yeah exactly than just enjoy the victory exactly you know and um and to see that that amount of change, like particularly in your lifetime, you're born in 1985, and this, you know, this momentum of change, mm. and yet there are parts, I mean, obviously large parts of the United States, relevant political parts, and parts here, mm. like fortunately a small minority, but a very loud and well-resourced one, who's trying to fight that back. Yeah. Like, what does that say about where we go we're going when a backlash can be that angry and intense it's terrifying i think i think you know i just never take for granted the rights that we have and i think it's very important to recognize the struggle that's you know to, to kind of be grateful to everyone else who has struggled so hard to get us to where we are but also just to be kind of cognizant of the fact that once we have our rights, i mean rights can be taken away as well so it, i mean it makes me very nervous to think that but it's also part of i think now my way of dealing with those anxieties i think is to direct it into works of creation. Um, and you know, it's interesting, since this book has come out, I, I was kind of nervous about it to a certain extent, because I mean, I was out to my family and, and you know, friends and things like that, but um, professionally, it's not like I'd, you know, ever written a queer story before, and I knew that this would be sort of, in some ways, a very sort of public outing as kind of an own, own voices story. And I was a little bit, I wasn't, I knew it was important for me and I wasn't changing my mind about it, but I did wonder whether it would, would perhaps, you know, some of my readers of my earlier novels might not be so into this book or they might not engage with it. And instead, one of the best responses I've had since this book has come out is that I've had many people of, um, you know, who are perhaps in their 60s or 70s come up to me and say, this is the first book focusing on a queer relationship that they've ever read. And I've had, I think, you know, over five people now come up to me since the book was released and say, you know, I just never really understood it. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't really understand the gays. Um, but I really enjoyed your book and, it now it, and now I understand it and I get it a bit more. And I mean, that's, that gives me faith, you know. No, it is, it really does speak to the transformative power of mm. love, conveyed not only, I mean, not only as a social message, but as an individual experience. Like, the book is intensely romantic. And it's interesting reading it in the context of the other two books, like, particularly in Burial Rights, where you have a character who, who is, who's absolutely abandoned to love, mm. I think is the way. And, and there's quite a complex and sophisticated sexuality that infuses her story in the first book, where she speaks of, you know, the normalisation of sexual abuse mm. in her, like, that she doesn't even process as a victimisation because that's just how her life is. And then to have this sort of glimpse at this profound passion that destroys her, does mm. actually destroy her, to take it to a place and go, this is... The, the, the transformative potential of this feeling does not have to end in a whale fat fire. Yeah. Is, um, it's very interesting that the trajectory that, that you've been on as an author has to make that joyous story a queer story. Mm -hmm. Well, this is also the first time that I've featured characters which aren't based on any historical figures. You know, the, these women are invented. I did look for stories. I looked... I was hoping, you know, that I might come across, you know, a, <coughs> excuse me, a, you know, a romance in, in the letters or the journals that I was reading, um, or even just a very close friendship. Um, but I, uh, I didn't come across anything. And, but that was actually a really wonderful place to find myself in the end, because even though sometimes it can be hugely overwhelming to realise that, you know, you can invent whatever you like, um, I still felt very much kind of 
that the book would be grounded in, in sort of a broader research, but the ability to sort of come up with characters that could, I guess, serve my interests in terms of what I wanted to express, having characters filled with the kind of queer yearning, which I think, you know, forms such a strong part of um, adolescence for people belonging to, you know, the LGBT community, or certainly has been for me and my friends. Um, you know, it was something which was, I don't know, it felt, it, it felt more personal. Absolutely, but it also felt like a nice way to kind of counteract those other examinations of uh, of, of sex and and, and the power dynamics of, of largely abusive relationships which existed in the earlier novels. It's interesting because one of the reasons why your work can be very chilling is that I spoke before about the tactility, like the the observance of detail, you know, the houses and mm. the you know, the rituals of cleaning and all of this just incredible level of observation you have. How do you, writing for that historical period, get into that level of detail? Like, can you go to the 20, 1820s Ireland shop and say, show me how to use a hand lathe? Like, I think you actually can in Ireland, yeah. They're amazing. They have... Um, like, yeah, but that's where my family <laughs> left. <laughs> I mean, I, I, this is why I love research, right? It's actually for the struggle it can be to find these kinds of details. I mean, the history books and, you know, historical records are filled with this kind of grand sweeping narratives, but it's all macro stuff. It's so hard to find the micro, the tiny, especially domestic details of people's lives because it was ordinary at the time. Um, and so people didn't necessarily always document it. So, I, but I love, I love kind of finding out facts about those world. You know, what people ate and how they cooked and what they wore and what sort of fabric they used. Because I think this does give that kind of texture to creating that world. And I, um, those are the details I immediately seek out. I want, you know, I'm a very, I think I'm quite a visual writer. I need to be able to see it in order to write it. And to be able to see it, I need those small details. You know, what a spoon looks like, what is a spoon made out of? And this is why I think it takes me such a long to write books, because I spend so long trying to find out those answers. And sometimes you've got to dig really hard. I remember, this is a bit of a stupid story really, but I remember um, with burial rites, there was no one ever mentioned how anyone ever went to the toilet. And this was relevant because, I mean, you know, in winter you might have a blizzard outside. Were they using chamber pots? I mean, porcelain wasn't really very much, wasn't really there. People didn't really use those things. They had wooden bowls. And I remember just trying to find out this detail. And I couldn't, I couldn't. And I was sort of, I'd spent, you know, two years researching what it was like to live in a, in a turf house and, you know, sleep in a bath stuffer with however many other people. And I didn't have it. And I was at, um, I love going to living, like living museums. Uh, where people, you know, dress up in costume and things like that. At, at, you know, at worst, they're entertaining, and at best, they're actually incredibly detailed and accurate. And I went to a living museum in, uh, in Reykjavik, and I was sort of just kind of looking at... I was interested in, in the way in which people knitted and processed wool, and I was sort of taking a lot of... I take a lot of photographs of items that are in museums, and I put them up on the wall when I write to remind myself. And I was uh, about to catch the bus back to Reykjavik, and I thought, oh, I just, you know, nature calls. And I ducked into the loo. And on the back of the door, they had a history of toileting in Iceland. <laughs> and I was there with my notebook. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it's, it's just luck how you find this sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, it's always a hunt to try and find those, those little details. But um, I think that's why, in some ways, not being a historian serves me well, because I do a lot of research, which just seems kind of bizarre. I, you know, I... I'll, I'll read recipe books or I'll go to exhibitions in the Barossa on, on white work and foil work and, and things like that and you never know what you're going to find. It is interesting that that level of detail uh, present in the books, like it, it seems to generate story event for mm. you as well. Like that's an, it's an interesting dance between the plot, like a character-led plotting and a plotting that comes from you know, the physical limitations that are placed on your characters and places where they can't go, things that they're obliged to deal yeah. with. There's a really beautiful image. I mean, one of the things I really like about your books is that there, there are some really sympathetic male characters in them, like men who make better moral decisions than 
then you, you know, if you say, say you're a feminist on the internet, <laughs> you start thinking men are incapable of making based on the input values you receive. Um, and there's a really beautiful, hi everybody, welcome to Therapy with Van, this is my friend <laughs> Hannah. She's turned up to provoke some things from me today. We may have been talking about this in the green room. Um, but there's a, like a really beautiful image of a young man who helps a, a young woman across a river, mm. just as an act of generosity that is so profound to her at the mm. time, it becomes extremely significant to her yeah. in terms of her life and the situation that she faces. How many, can you think of more of the, the origins of those kind of moments of these limitations, like crossing a river or, you know, the amazing, um, uh, the quilting and the feathering mm. and these these moments that you find of these relationships of characters to their physical world. has What has really sent you off on one plot-wise or an event that you didn't necessarily see or are they... Are you a slave master absolutely beating the objects around your characters into submission? You know what, I think it's kind of, it's a dance, right? I think, you know, so much, I tend to do all my research first, but because then I don't like, really like referring to notes, I just kind of like to absorb it like a sponge and then kind of write out of whatever I remember or whatever is relevant to, to the book because that way I feel like not too much kind of superfluous information is going to find its way into it. You know, that's what I, I dislike in reading historical fiction, which just is kind of seems weighed down by the research. And I try to, you know, have a light touch. And I mean, it's an, it's an ongoing challenge, but I am... Um, so I tend, when I research, I tend to sort of take note of these things, but they tend to shape the way a character might be. So um, I'll make notes in a notebook about perhaps this, you know, if I, say, for instance, came across the tradition of a fetish lesson, which is when the women gather. It's an intensely sort of women-centred thing where these women would, would gather together in, in, a, in um, preparation for someone's wedding and they would be have all these bags of feathers which they would have picked up when, they're, for instance, their you know, fowl were, for, were molting. And then they would all sit together around the table, you know, headscarfs on, and they would strip the down off the central quill and pack it into jars. And it was sort of this kind of competition of who could pack it as firmly enough so you'd tip it outside and nothing would fall out. And then you'd, you know, eventually, after nights and nights of this sort of round table you know, feather stripping, you would have enough to gift someone an eider down for their wedding. And I just, I loved, for instance, coming across that because, and I actually did a bit of sort of other research and I found out there was this, this, these, this practice continues, uh, particularly in Poland. I saw some wonderful videos of these women sort of, you know, busying themselves and having a gossip and, and, and pulling all these feathers apart. And, um, but I just, I mean, you come across a detail like, you, like that and the novelist brain in me is thinking, what a wonderful vehicle for this sort of intensely, you know, for, for women to be able to come together and have a different kind of conversation that they would in the day-to-day -day sort of domestic routine of their lives in this world where perhaps these women don't actually always have an opportunity to come together because these are people who have a labouring class and they're, you know, from sun up to sun down, essentially they're, working with their families. Um, you know, this, there was always a sense of fetish license, for instance, being something which is intensely celebratory. So it just kind of, as a novelist, you think, oh, this is a fantastic thing to put in a book because it gives you an opportunity for your characters to interact in a different way with the other people there. And in the case that you mentioned earlier of this young man helping Agnes across a river, that was true, that, that was documented. <coughs> and it's this is when you're researching a real figure similarly with the good people with Nance Roach you come across things that you just couldn't make up as well I mean I always find that the most bizarre instances or the strangest uh, things in my books are actually just copied down from the record and the same is true with devotion even though the two main characters you know Hannah and Taya are fictionalized there's a journey in this boat a ship's journey and pretty well every single event described on that ship's journey is essentially just copied from, not copied, I did change it, um, <laughs> but was inspired by uh, the, a journal of a, of a ship's captain. You know, so details, things like a, a pregnant woman falling, falling down the stairs um, and, you know, the hatches being battened down and people being sincerely worried that they were going to suffocate from the lack of fresh air. And, and, you know, the seasickness and the kind of rations and the arguments over rations, all of this sort of stuff is just, it can be there if, if you know where to look and you know how to discover these kinds of rich details. And so whenever I come across anything, I don't know, I mean, I don't know if anyone's read 
The Luminous Solution by Charlotte Wood, and she talks about heat seeking. And so much of it is this kind of process of just kind of being guided by your gut or your intuition, and you stumble across a detail or some research, even something little like white work. In the case of devotion, this, this practice of embroidering white thread upon white cloth, it just kind of sets something off in me. And I think that that has life in it. You know, that's, that's like, it's hot to touch, you know. There's something there which is going to contribute something. And I feel like I never really know what that's going to be. I'm not a plotter. I write, you know, so many drafts and writing is my way of working out what I am writing. But I note it down and I know it's going to make its way in there. And it always does. So it's that, yeah, it's that weird dance of sort of, you know, having this kind of objective list of stuff you need to find out from the past and going to the records, but also stumbling across these amazing details that you think, oh yeah, God, this is gonna, this is gonna shape character or this is gonna shape plot. And you kind of get pulled by the research and then you t drag it another way and then it pulls you off in another direction. And it's the unpredictability and the uncertainty and the, and the joy of discovery that I think keeps on bringing me back to the genre. Mm. Oh, I, I could just chat to my friend all day. But um, some of you, I'm aware of the fact that some of you might want to chat to my friend. So where is the roving microphone? We have a roving microphone. Yep. I'm going to use this opportunity to subtly pick my mobile phone from the ground. I don't know if you noticed that I splattered it <laughs> earlier. I've been so engrossed by the conversation. It's just sat there like a leaf from a storm. Do we have a question? She said... Question, a question? There must be a question out there. Here we go. This is your chance, people. That lowered the tone. That lowered the tone was an example of lowering. <laughs> Turning everything into a game show. Thank you. Hi, Hannah. Um, just wanted to ask what's next for you. Oh, thank you. Um, the, the, the question everyone dreads at a writers' festival. Um, no, thank you. That's a lovely question. I'm um, actually in the process of writing. <coughs> excuse me. Um, the third draft of of the Good People. So this is, you know, I've been writing the adaptation um, for screen. Uh, I've been really enjoying doing some screenwriting later. Actually, oops, a daisy. Poured water on Hannah. Um, oh, good. Oh, good. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I've, I've written a feature film, which has just been, I think they've just they've wrapped shooting earlier this year and it's now in post-production and now I'm in the process of trying to yeah, polish off this script so that we can start working on that adaptation and getting things organised. So that's what I'm, in, I'm doing sort of, you know, when I go home tonight. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to work tonight, who am I kidding? Um, when I go back home on Monday. Um, uh, but when I, uh, but yeah, in terms of other book ideas, um, I do. I am working on a few things actually. Um, I have, I have something that I, I'm really excited by, and someone asked me to describe it without really describing it because I haven't actually told my publishers what I'm doing yet. And I please think, don't um, put this on the internet <laughs> if she has not had the conversation <laughs> with her publisher. But I was sort of saying, you know, if this, if devotion. <coughs> talking as I did earlier about how every book sort of leading into the next one, if devotion describes, you know, uh, is it came from my own love of landscape, I think this next book is going to be much more about what it is to have a love for landscape. Um, but that's all I'm actually going to say because, you know, I haven't written a word of it yet and I'm still researching it. <laughs> So it's, you know, unsullied. It hasn't been kind of destroyed by my terrible attempts to start drafting it yet. It's the exciting time when it's perfect in my head. Um, so I'm going to keep it in that stage before I sort of destroy it by a really piss-poor pitch up on stage. <laughs> Three best-selling novels. Uh, do we have another question? People up the back, someone up the back. Yes. Hi, Hannah. Um, the scene with your two, two protagonists in Devotion where they hold the moss and the lichen, um, it really struck me, just the whole climate change. Um, how aware were you when you were writing Devotion in regards to the whole what's happening with the planet at the moment? And Because I, I was really, that scene just, I don't know, exploded my brain and then from then on I, I became very aware, um, but it might have been my own reading of your book, that I just, I just saw the whole eco-fiction kind of landscape within the book 
from that scene onwards. So, yeah, um, lichen and moss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That's such a, a lovely thing to hear. Um, you know, it's in so many ways I think of... I don't really think of Devotion as a historical novel, though obviously it's set in the past. I think it is actually very much a, a contemporary novel because it's born of my contemporary concerns, whether that be, you know, my reaction to the to the plebiscite. <coughs> and also I think, you know, a, um, a heightened awareness of the importance of respecting nature and also my own thoughts and the thinking I've been doing about I guess the, um, you know, the problems that arise when we start to regard nature as object rather than subject. And I think so much of the relationship that the characters have to the natural world is about trying to reinstate it as a subject, you know, as, as being, as, and I think that's, you know, feeds into so much of the spirituality which is explored, which I, you know, in terms of how I wanted to explore it in the book, you know, nature is very central to that. And I think, you know, without sort of sitting up here and expounding forever on my views of, my environmentalist views, um, I think it does take that kind of radical shift in the way in which we regard our natural world in order for us to start to make amends and to fix our very broken Western relationship with it particularly. Um, so yeah, I mean, all of that stuff absolutely feeds into those scenes because, you know, these are the questions that I'm asking myself, how can we... How can, we, how can we change the way in which we regard the natural world? How can we stop thinking of it as something other to us? And within the religious context of this book too, I mean, it was so wonderful to be able to write a character who, has a, who sees nature as something that doesn't belong to her, but that she belongs to it, you know, that they are equals, it's something that she communes with. Um, whereas the rest of her community, you know, nature is under the dominion of God and, you know, they also have dominion over it. So, I mean, it was something that was very much, yeah, at the forefront of my thinking in terms of nature writing and the, the ways in which I wanted to depict it. Um, and I think that's probably why, you know, I, I see myself continuing in that kind of direction. I mean, it's the kind of thing that you just can't, you can't avoid when you're writing, I think. I think every kind of contemporary Australian writer is writing eco-fiction, whether or not they recognise it or, or otherwise, and I don't think I'm exempt from that either. Yeah, it, is, um, it is kind of revel revelatory as well. There's a wonderful moment in Beryl Riots where it's revealed one of the, ca the characters' club seals, mm. and all I could think was, yeah, that guy deserves what's <laughs> coming to him. Yeah. You know, the world the world shall have its vengeance <laughs> on that guy for the seal clubbing oh, is <laughs> is quite the poignant moment. Yeah. I've got to say. You know, these are the petty vengeances we can act out as novelists, right? Is to to kill off every character who is who is cruel to animals and so forth. Yes. Don't be fooled by the Adelaide manners, all writers are psychotic. Don't let Adelaide take credit for my manners. <laughs> <laughs> um being from Wollongong, you can imagine the uh, comparisons are quite broad. Um, we have time for one more question. Do we have another question? Hello. Oh, God, Hi. yes, we do. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hannah, I'm a new fan. Van, I'm a long-term fan, so I'm having a total fangirl moment. Um, but, Hannah, I was interested in you when you were saying... I never set out to be a novelist and that writing is your way of working out what you're writing. So how was it that your first novel came about when you kind of sat there and went, hang on, whoa, I think this might be a book book? Yeah. Um, how did that transition happen for you? I think it had just kind of... So I went, I went on this exchange to Iceland and I heard about Agnes Magnus Dottir. And at the time, I actually have been, you know, when I was talking about burial rights... I sort of would say, oh, then I didn't really... I would think about her, but I didn't really write anything until I started doing honours in... started studying creative writing. But I actually found my mum, as mums are wont to do, is sort of rock up on my doorstep and dump all of my oils and crap that I'd left at her place. And I was going through it, and I found all these poems that I had written about Agnes Magnus Dottir when I was there on exchange. And I was sort of had completely forgotten about that. But it was... Um, it was not even her story which led me to writing, even though there was obviously something already simmering there. It was being in Iceland just as someone who loved to write and suddenly finding myself in a society that 
elevated writers and authors and you know a place where literature was so central to kind of a national identity that made me apply to do my course from Iceland. Um, it was a really wonderful and life-changing experience in that regard. And then I, uh, I did you know my three years, I did a Bachelor of Creative Rights and then I went on to do honours and with the honours thesis you're sort of asked to, I don't know, write 10,000 words of a creative product. And by that stage, I was just super homesick for Iceland. I just wanted to write about Iceland. And I thought, well, you know, what am I going to write? And I thought, well, this Agnes woman won't leave me alone. I keep on thinking about her. And that was the start of it. And then I just, you know, I just went too deep. And then the next thing I know, I'm asking my supervisor if I can do a, a PhD. Um, to continue the, what had I realised was going to be a book. Initially, it was going to be a verse novel. Um, I was a big um, <laughs> Dorothy Porter fan. That would have been the best conversation with an agent ever. <laughs> you know. So I've got this idea. <laughs> well, this was the conversation I had with my supervisor. And then she's like, you might find it difficult to convey the complexities of 19th century Iceland in a few stanzas. You might need to give it a bit more room. And I did, and I realised I needed a lot more room, and then it kind of, I realised I needed, you know, 100,000 words to tell that story. And then I think I realised that um, writing novels suited my rambling nature of working my way into books much more than, you know, terrible poetry or half-hearted attempts at plays. Um, so, but in terms of sort of writing, working out what I'm writing by writing, I mean that. I mean, I, I'm not someone who plots out books. I have friends who do and I admire them for that because it seems very sort of um, expedient. Um, I, uh, I, I start by writing just what I feel. It might just be a description. It might be a bit of a character. I usually throw away about 50,000 words of whatever I'm doing. I often start again and I end up doing about 14 drafts of every book. And by maybe draft seven, I think I've worked out what I'm doing. And then probably the remaining seven drafts of me just cutting adjectives. <laughs> I don't I know have if that an answers your question. problem. I feel like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, guys, I could talk to Hannah all night, and I'm sure you could as well. She's totally, totally extraordinary. And I'd like to say that we both vindicate, never listen to the advice against doing a creative writing degree, oh, yeah. no, because we it. both earn our livings from writing and we both have them. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to recommend that you do buy a copy of Devotion, not only because it's her new book and it's incredibly beautiful, but how about you mail a copy to your American niece? Because <laughs> she and her friends may really, really need it. Thanks, Dan. Now, the good news is that Hannah and I will be uh, doing a signing out in the foyer. Uh, I will not feel hurt if you will queue for Hannah, but I'll be there to do jokes if you get bored in the line. <laughs> um, can you please put your hands together for the extraordinary and magnificent and very generous Hannah Kent? And Van, thank you.